Welcome to Bake to the Future, the show where we examine what is happening in the baking industry with a future-focused lens. Today, we are bringing you part two of our conversation about the Farm Bill, what it is, and how it could impact the baking industry in 2023. I'm Haley Blumenreich, and I'm joined by Katie Jewell and our Farm Bill expert, Lee Sanders, ABA Senior Vice President of Government Relations and Public Affairs. All right, let's get into it. And so to me, it seems like, you know, of course, everything is political, right? So what are kind of the angles that Republicans and Democrats have as they're working through this bill? Do you know? Well, sure. I mean, I I know for, let's say, the administration, um, a big priority for them is um, climate policy. And so from that perspective, I would expect to see more and new programs around climate policy, maybe around uh, regenerative agriculture, which could be an opportunity for us. It hasn't been defined, regenerative agriculture, but those processes um, are underway. It's kind of an extra step. It's beyond sustainable agriculture. It's regenerating the earth and the soil to being even better than it was before. And so I think there's going to be a lot of opportunity there, um, opportunities for bakers to partner with others and to help form um, that new policy as it moves forward in this farm bill. I think from a Republican standpoint, they're going to be looking there, you know, it is a very expensive bill. And so where, where have there not been efficiencies? Where can there be cuts? And, um, you know, there in particular, I look at the nutrition programs, the SNAP programs. I think there'll be discussion of, um, there was a lot of expansion during COVID. And so, Um, how is that going to look? What kind of discussions are we going to hear about? I mean, there have already been some discussions um, and questions around perhaps a need for a work requirement, you know, to be part of the SNAP program for able-bodied adults. So they're going to be looking at efficiencies, um, which programs are working, And then you're going to have some new initiatives that are going to be overriding from the administration that they'd like to see. 80%, you said, was going to be of this bill was going to be nutrition focused. What will that involve? And I guess what kind of outcomes do you see happening? And how do you, this is a multi part question, but how will that impact the baking industry? Well, I mean, the the bakers sell to a lot of those programs. And so it's an opportunity um, to maybe expand business opportunities. Um, and and also um, to think about you know, the importance of the nutrient density of grain foods, both whole grains and enriched grains and the value that they bring to consumers um, and to their health, and to their families. And so being able to convey that, talk about that, talk about the importance, for example, SNAP choice is one of our priorities. And what does that mean? SNAP is, um, used to be called food stamps program. And so there's been some discussion of, of, um, limiting, uh, choices for participants. And so we don't think that's a good idea for a lot of different reasons. It brings a social stigma to those that participate in the program, you know, um, should we really be treating um, those participants differently than any other person that goes to the grocery store to feed their family? And so thinking about those day-to-day decisions and thinking about, um, you know, the importance of variety, cultural choices, and um, health equity. Those are new discussions. The health equity is going to be, uh, have a higher visibility in this farm bill to the discussions that we see. It seems like it's all kind of intertwined, like it, there's there's just so much going on because we've had you on the podcast before. And I know we talk a lot about all of these other government programs, like the dietary guidelines is separate from this. We've got, you know, here's the farm bill, um, but it all 
kind of works in this crazy ecosystem, <laughs> which I guess is why we exist as a as an organization, because we help kind of <laughs> connect all that. But I'm just starting to draw all these, you know, kind of connections between why then the dietary guidelines are so important because they define that framework that all of this then operates off of, right? Right. So the dietary guidelines, and it's interesting, they've, I know this is about the farm bill, but it's just <laughs> two no, minutes. It's fine. I, I, I like to try <laughs> to understand, like, I want to see like a, a, you know, a flow chart and an org chart about how mm. all of this stuff works. And that's well, what it's I'm kind of interesting. In it's interesting. The dietary guidelines, they're also starting their five-year review process for the 2025 dietary guidelines. And so the, they've had their first meeting and they've had a lot of discussion about health equity. Um, they've had a lot of discussion about um, food patterns, um, processed foods. There's a lot of issues that different issues um, that this group is going to talk about that there are 20 members of the Dietary Guidelines Advisory Committee. They had their first meeting February 9th and 10th. And so they'll be, um, they're just starting that process, but they'll be listening uh, and reviewing research and comments that come in from groups like the American Bakers Association. You know, we uh, are the lead chair for the grain chain. So the whole wheat chain is engaged there. And so it's an opportunity to talk about the the health and nutrient density of grain foods. And so, but that's something that can carry over. Certainly all that good work, all the research that we're seeing, those are good things that we can talk about when we're talking about the nutrition programs for the farm bill too. And the importance and then, of, of our commodity, have, which is bread. And then we <laughs> also have eating. the White House conference, right? So we've talked that's about right. that on the show before too. Yes. And so kind of like, how does all of, how, how do it, like, do things all kind of like, in a way from when the rubber meets the road, that's where the farm bill is. Is that kind of a way that we could consider it? Well, there's a confluence of issues, I would say. Okay. That. And so there is maybe more emphasis right now um, in the policy world on nutrition. The, the White House conference certainly looked at opportunities to engage more folks, um, to look at and ask for commitments from industry and other partners um, to work together. And so that was a springboard for other initiatives, such as um, the redefinition of healthy and looking at... Um, Which you know, that's for, FDA, that's the Food and, and Drug Administration, administration right? That's like right. this is... That's right. So it's, <laughs> okay. a, it's a cross-government affair. So... Um, but it is a way, I think all these things, the bottom line is all, all these things are opportunities uh, for ABA to be engaged and for us to talk about the value of these, how these impact our members, and and talk about the priorities that our members have. And then speaking of engagement earlier, and I wanted to kind of hold the conversation and kind of understand a little bit more about what we're doing, how all of this stuff, this huge governmental ecosystem when it comes to food policy, which is huge. We're talking about one one bill in that. Um, but there are ways for members to be engaged. Of course, we have our, our our rise to action where we have action alerts where I'm certain that we'll we'll call on our members to um, uh, request participation there. But then we also have uh, some events coming up in the summer and in fall, or maybe it's just the fall, um, that we haven't had in a few years, certainly not since this podcast is, has launched in 2020. So we haven't. It's called a fly-in. And so maybe we could talk a little bit about what a fly-in is, because I, I want to have some while I have you on the mic, we haven't had one in a while. And so I think we have, was, we have, well, we smaller have ones. One. We yeah, had we've had one in, in April of last year. Okay. And we brought our commodity and agriculture policy professional group in and we had a, a in-person meeting, but then we also went over to USDA and talked to them about supply chain issues. So that was a great opportunity. And, and we also, one of the farm bill issues came up. We talked, well, actually more than one, we talked about the sugar program, but we also talked about the conservation reserve program. 
And, um, you know, that is, is one of our priorities. And we want to make sure that there is all the available prime farmland, farmland acreage that's available can be out there so that uh, crops can be grown like wheat. And often the Conservation Reserve Program um, acres are in arid acres, which is great for wheat growth. And so we talked about that, especially in the drought last year. And uh, right after that meeting, um, Secretary Vilsack did open up um, acreage and allow uh, farmers to get out of their contracts early. So that was that was great. And so hearing from our members, having their voice at the table, talking about why those programs like like the CRP program, what that means to get some flexibility, that made a difference. And so that's what we're going to do again this summer. We're looking at a fly-in uh, in mid-July, and um, that will be Farm Bill focused. We're going to invite our ABA members and our, our commodity and ag policy, um, policy um, professional group to come into town and go up and talk with um, the House and Senate ag leadership uh, to talk and go over to USDA. Uh, we hopefully can also go over to the, the CFT. CFTC, the Commodity Futures Trading Commission, ABA is the only end product user that sits on their ag committee, ag advisory committee. So that's a great opportunity for us to go over and talk about the hurdles that we're seeing with the supply chain, um, what our farm bill priorities are. So we've talked about the sugar program. We've talked about research, um, the conservation reserve program, and then those um, nutrition program. So those that really hits the highlights of those things that impact uh, the bottom line in the businesses and business opportunities for bakers. And then in the fall, we are going to also have, uh, we'll be back to have our baker's dozen congressional um, reception in the fall in November. And so that's going to be a great opportunity to bring people together. It's such a fun event. Um, We have our members donate product. And so uh, members of Congress and their staff can come and sample products. Um, and we have such a, a wide variety of awesome products. It's it's really a fun event. And then we also ha- are going to have people on the Hill talking about our priorities at the time. And so, you know, that also coupled with some of our uh, policy professional groups, uh, it, it's going to be a, a, a big gathering of the industry, a great opportunity for us to go to the Hill, a great opportunity for bakers uh, to engage. And we really look forward to, to seeing everybody for these all these different events that, that are coming up. Okay, you've been through a few farm bills before. How many, how, what, what number farm bill is this for you? Oh, that's a good question. Um, because I think sometimes, you know, people in DC, they kind of gauge their, their tenure on like, Oh, I've done (laughs) five farm bills. So I'm just curious. I would say, well, and then I, you know, was experiencing farm bills when I worked on Capitol Hill at the beginning of my career as well. So I've been through maybe more than most. So I would say maybe six or seven. That'd be about right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So you've, you've been around farm bill years for a while, do you think that it will be done in the timely manner that Mr. Thompson is looking to have this done by? Do you think that our fall fly-in might also be a farm bill fly-in? I do think that it could be. I know he is being very optimistic. I'm an optimistic person too, but I'm just not sure we'll be able to work out all those very complex details uh, in just the next couple months. So I think there's a very good chance that uh, we still may be talking about this in the fall. And then it's a great opportunity for us to go up as they're in the final stages of, of, um, of their negotiations. So hopefully we'll get two bites of the apple or two bites of the bread slice on this one. <laughs> we, Love talking to you, Lee. You're such an expert in the farm bill. As you said, you've been through so many and you've seen it from all angles, which I think is so helpful for us to to understand all the various aspects of it and how it kind of fits in, as Katie was saying, the ecosystem. Is there anything else that you want to share with our members before we conclude? 
I would just um, really encourage folks to get engaged, to participate in our um, our CAPSI, our Commodity and Agriculture Policy Group, um, and to come to our fly-in in July, participate in November, and um, and let us know. You know, we want to hear from you on the priorities. I laid out what those were today. But if there are other issues that are important, we want to know. And then we also want to hear your stories on how these different issues are impacting your business so that when we go up to the Hill, we can share those stories with uh, policy influencers. Awesome. Yeah, we know how powerful those stories can be and how they can really help move the needle. So thank you so much, Lee, for joining us today. We appreciate your time. Thanks, Haley. Thanks, Katie. Share your feedback on this episode and more by emailing hello at AmericanBakers.org. We love hearing from you. And don't forget to subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts, Apple, Google Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, Amazon Music, or Ghana. 